Hi, good afternoon, everyone. We've got our last speaker who's making quite an entrance. Welcome, Angela. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for being here. Hi. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for, thank you for being here. Uh, there are so many great panels. It's always quite fascinating to see the, the full room, so thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here. My name is Pierre-Yves Judot. I'm the director of portfolio of the International Fund for Public Interest Media. We're a new organization. We're an independent multilateral initiative that's seeking to respond to the existential economic crisis that are facing so many public interest media organizations around the world, in low- and middle-income countries in particular. We will be launching officially on World Press Freedom Day in a couple of weeks. The way we seek to address this issue, and I'll be very quick on this, is to provide financial support to organizations that are really struggling, that are about to be captured by political or economic interest, or that are about to go bankrupt. We also support organizations to invest and transform, transform themselves, to invest in innovation on how they distribute content, how they engage with their audience on their business models. And then finally, and this is very central to who we are as a fund, we're looking to address the systemic challenges. We're looking for structural solutions, and we're supporting local initiatives that work on structural, structural problems, like government advertising and how it's being distributed, like how media organizations work with tech platforms and how tech platforms are being regulated, and so on and so forth. I won't give you the, the full list right now. Um, so that's me. We uh, have a lot of great speakers on, on this panel. We're going to be talking about young people in the news. You might have noticed there are not a lot of very young people on the panel. <laughs> However, we do have a lot of we do have three speakers that have thought long and hard about this and that have great experience and great success at doing what most companies, most media organizations fail to do, speak to the younger people, speak to the younger generations. I was in Germany last week, speaking to a TV, media exec TV executive. His audience is 65 on average. It's like, but you're not even mainstream anymore. You're like a niche. <laughs> like, yeah, mainstream media, no, niche. <laughs> Anyways. Three great speakers that uh, have a lot of experience on, and, and kind of success on, on doing that. You might have noticed as well that the way we've kind of framed the session, I think, could be debated a lot. We are talking about a disconnect between the younger generations and the news. I think we could debate that. I think we, should, we shouldn't make a value judgment that people, like, we know we're all talking about news avoidance, we're all worried about it, we're all worried about how that impacts our societies at large. Uh, but I think it's worth kind of considering that maybe just younger generations consume news in a very different way, even that the definition of what is news, what is journalism, is a little bit kind of different and challenged compared to what it used to be. And so I hope this doesn't feel like we're all whining about the good old days, you know, TV, media, TV executive and 65-year-old audience. Um, so what I hope this is, is that we have a conversation on how changing consumption patterns have deep implications for how media organizations think about their work. I hope we're going to be talking about innovations that have worked, that we've seen, that you've been experimenting with, that you've been experimenting with, uh, Juan Camillo, and kind of where we see the most promise, whether it's in terms of the topics that get covered, the people whose voices we hear, the formats and the distribution strategies, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I want also us to talk about what this means for a media organization, what this means for a newsroom. Is it, it's probably quite different to manage a newsroom that's trying to do this kind of different formats, different ways to, to talk and to engage with the audience than it used to be even just a few years ago. Uh, and obviously we have a lot of disruption coming from other things like, like technology and so how does that impact how you think about your newsroom, used, your team, your collective vision for how you do journalism together. Um, let me introduce my three great panelists. Uh, I'm going to start with Nanjela. Nanjela Nyabola is a writer, researcher and activist from Kenya. Langella has done a lot of research on how the information space, tech, and civic engagement kind of shape politics. And so we'd love to hear a lot about that in a second. Uh, next to her on my right, uh, Juan Camillo Maldonado is the director of Mutente, a great hybrid and highly innovative media startup in Colombia, uh, which combines the power of social media, of journalism, and of civic engagement. Uh, and so we'll hear a lot about the things 
they've tried very successfully to engage with audiences that maybe wouldn't participate as much in public debate and in kind of access to information otherwise. And then Ramsey Tesdal, who is the co-founder and CEO of SOT. SOT is a leading audio content company in the Arab world, uh, greatly successful, growing very fast, and whose audience is primarily, I think, 70% under, under 35. Uh, so we'd love to hear how you've, how you've been successful at achieving that. And I might start with you, Nanjala, if that's okay. okay. Um, as we were discussing, like the, the consumption patterns have evolved a lot. People have access to information in very different ways than they, than they used to. A lot of the work you've been doing is, is on the African continent where basically more than half of the population is under 20. Half of the people, half of the audiences are below 20. Uh, how is the evolution of those consumption patterns kind of shaping the media scene and society and, and politics more broadly? Sure. Um, push? Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, th thank you for that question. So I'm on this panel with multiple hats. I both write news, produce news, edit. I've done a significant amount of editing as well and kind of seen things from different perspectives, primarily facing an African audience, but also often producing information in Western audiences and international audiences, sort of that loops back to the African continent. And each of those experiences kind of reveals a different piece of this puzzle. Um, I think First of all, it's absolutely important to note, like from the African continent, the average age is 19.7. So the vast majority of Africans are below the age of 35. And this is really reflected, as you said, in how, where people get the information that they consider news. Um, for newsrooms, for newspapers, for televisions, or stations, for radio stations, well, I'll put radio in a separate bucket. Let's focus on TV and print uh, particularly. It means fewer people are buying newspapers. Mm -hmm. And that is not just a factor of um, what's in the papers. It's also a factor of how much it costs to buy a newspaper relative to incomes, relative to other things. Um, we, we, we had a really long running conversation when the last price jump for newspapers is a big public conversation in my country, Kenya, because it was really a choice between am I going to buy a packet of milk or am I going to buy a newspaper that I'm going to read for one day and then I'm going to have to replace um, tomorrow or a packet of milk that I can drink over two or three days. So, it, 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 you know, the inflationary pressure, the, the, the news is expensive and the lies are free. Um, it really is hitting people's perspective on is it worth investing in? And you think about, you add the layer of youth unemployment, then it just becomes um, a really difficult position that we're expecting people to be in. So the cost of the news, I think, is, is part of it. I, I said put radio in a separate bucket because I think radio remains um, one of the most popular ways uh, for people to get information. Certainly in Africa, and I would say this is the same in Asia as well. Um, I don't know the Latin American context that well. Um, and why radio is able to do this is, I think, community radio is, a, is what is resolving this I issue for a lot of people because community radio is a lot cheaper to produce. It's local people, it's people that they know, it's teachers, it's you know people who are volunteering at the stations and things like that. And it has that, um, some of our community radio stations in Kenya, for example, have a five kilometer radius. The, the law says they can't broadcast over a five kilometer radius. So it's hyper local. You have informal settlements whereby the, the person, the, the news is what happened around the corner, um, you know, yesterday. The news is who was visiting the hospital the other day. And it kind of has that local feel or touch to it. So community radio in the scheme of where people get information from, at least in Kenya and some of the countries that I've done community radio research in, um, has been an outlier in this like decline of audiences. But generally that price point um, is really hitting people harder than I think uh, we realize. Um, I think that there's also a question of what role um, news products, because I really want to distinguish between the news and news products. I think people are still hungry for news, and this is what answers the question of where are people getting the information from. I think people still want news. I think news is still part of our social cultures. But I think news um, products have occup occupy a different social position. And part of it is, um, what are people gonna, um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to find, because I'm in a room full of journalists, <laughs> find a way of, of saying this that is, um, there are values that I think are embedded in the way news products are disseminated that I think don't always come across the way young people 
um, respond to. And I think one of the things that always stands out is we talk about these TikTok videos and these TikTok explainers that go really viral. Yesterday I was um, talking to someone who pointed me to a John Stewart kind of character that's emerging in Kenya. Um, why do people get their news from satirical shows? Why do people get comedy to get their their news information? Why does that become the main way through which young people get news? Well, part of that is authenticity. It's trust. It's integrity. It's all of these mushy things that we know are part of what the news should represent in different societies, but we're not necessarily very good at thinking about them as people who are in newsrooms, because I have to get this copy out today. I have to get this copy out tomorrow. Am I going to start to think about authenticity and trust and sincerity and you know all of these things? But I find that um, socially, what's happened for a lot of people is the institutions that we used to get our social value signaling from have retreated in many of our societies. It's, it's church, it's politicians, it's all of these things, all of these social dynamics where we get our, more, our community signaling from. And the retreat of those spaces then causes a, so, a secondary social disorientation. And I think what young people want from the people they look up to is all of these things that we're not very good at talking about. And I think that's part of the storytelling that's embedded in, well, what, where am I going to get the information that's going to help me decide you know, political issues, that's going to help me decide. I, I'm, I'm thinking specifically, for example, about what's happening with the LGBT question in East Africa, that we are having this resurgence of homophobia in the public space because our politicians are abdicating a value-driven role in the society. And the young people are like, well, what do I believe about this issue? What do I think about this? What do I feel about this? But nobody's giving any signaling because the journalists are like, well, I don't, I don't want to tell you what to think about this. You know, you have to decide for yourself. You have to come to the conclusion yourself. And so the only people who are taking a stand and the only people who are telling stories that have a spine in it are the people who are on TikTok are the people who are on WhatsApp, even for better or worse, right? It's for better or worse. It's people who are driving the conversation in both directions. So I think that's part of the puzzle and it is a complicated part of the puzzle. It requires a lot of skills that we're not necessarily attuned to reaching for, um, but I think it's a social transformation that is what, there's a space that is existing and is being filled by people who don't necessarily have the skills the training, the interest even in doing media journalism, but they understand that people want a certain kind of story about the community that they live in. And that's the misinformation, to sort of wrap it up, that's the misinformation community, that's what all these people are providing that I think we have to engage with. Thank you for that. I'm gonna turn to you, Ramsey, because that's the kind of, I guess the negative side of the of the coin, right? It's people telling stories to misinform, to push specific agendas. We've also seen a lot of people telling stories to inform people, kind of combining journalism and some of its standards and principles with different ways of sharing that information with the public. And Ramsey, a lot of the podcasts you've been producing and distributing are doing exactly that, right? And it's resulted in a huge success with, again, your audience being 70% over under 35. So how, why has that resonated, you think? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think people saw maybe that recent video that went viral where the famous tennis, Serbian tennis player, player uh, Djokovic, he's, uh, there was this interviewer saying, how does it feel to play against the young people that are, and, and he was like, 35 is the new 25. <laughs> and it was great. And it was interesting because as I've gotten older, the young folk, the definition just keeps getting longer to include myself. <laughs> I refuse to admit. Ah, no, khalas, we're over the line now. So I think, you know, to answer your question, really, really, I have three points. And the first, the third one was, that I think, the answer, or part of the answer. Um, it's really, what we try to do is we, we look at storytelling. Um, so we do narrative-driven podcasts um, in Arabic from the Middle East. And the idea really there is to wrap these issues that are really important to all of us that maybe are not being spoken about in a way that's extremely engaging, right? Um, so we let people tell their own stories. We do it in a way, we help them tell it in a really engaging way. And we look at kind of the fundamentals of storytelling. So uh, filmmaking, where you have characters, you have plot, 
uh, protagonists, you have you know, the storyline that goes in different ways. These are really interesting ways to kind of think about how to talk about news, how to talk about what's happening um, around the world, um, around you, around us. Um, so that's one point. The, the second point I think is a simple one. It's don't be boring, right? I think I'll, at least in Arabic, and I'll speak about specific contextual uh, examples, we have different forms of Arabic, right? So we have a formal classical Arabic. Uh, we were talking about this last night, actually, um, how it relates to Spanish and if Spanish can do, uh, has the same problems. In Arabic, we have a very formal uh, kind of classical Arabic that everybody sort of knows, but they don't really speak. And the news has always been published and presented in this. It is a second or a third or a fourth language to most people. It's so foreign, it's very classical, it's very authoritarian in some ways. And so this is kind of just a linguistic issue. You know, don't be boring. We have to speak in our own languages. Um, so that's, that's a really important point. And then I think the third point for us is looking at analytics. It's not just shooting in the dark anymore. We don't know how many people are listening to the radio. We can ask them and they can say, I do or I do not and how much, but we don't actually know if they do. Radio is still really important. We know people listen to it. Um, but with the internet, we can, we actually know for the most part, how many people clicked on it, how many people listened, how far people listened. Um, and just a, an, an, an anecdote about that, before the pandemic, we saw a very clear pattern, super simple, right? People woke up, they checked their phones, they got ready, and then they started listening to podcasts as they went to work, as they went to school, and then it dropped down and it came back up again towards the end of the day. People started to come home. Some people listened during the day, but not as much. It was during the morning and the evening. Suddenly the pande pandemic happens. Overnight, people's patterns changed. It flattened out. People that didn't need to commute, people were working from home, going to school from home, they could listen any time of the day. And so this is just a simple uh, data point that we were able to recognize and say, okay, maybe it's not as important when or uh, what day we publish because the, 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 the listening has flattened. In the Middle East, for example, it's a very late culture. Things start at 8, 9, 10, 11. So we publish late in the evening a lot of times to get those people at that point where they are. And so I think really it's about meeting them, meeting the audiences where they are. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Juan Camillo, can I come to you? Because you've also been pushing the boundaries of what is journalism and how to think about kind of sharing really important information with, with your audiences. Um, and the way you've done that is by kind of creating this concept and methodology around social conversations. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. And also, like, just kind of share with the audience how that has led to really incredible levels of, of engagement on kind of really thorny, complicated social issues, right? Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. This is very exciting. I, one of the things I applaud about IFPIM and all this adventure that IFPIM is beginning is that your guys are creating a community of learning about how to solve really complex issues that we all share and one of them is how do we transform the relationship with our audiences. Mutante's story begins when I was directing a prior project I was working on. Uh, I co-founded a peace project that was supposed to cover the peace process between the guerrilla and the government in 2014, 15, and 16. That was a very divisive process. And all of a sudden, I was coming from a legacy media where I had to be neutral and I have to be objective and balanced and all that. And all of a sudden, I was covering a process that I really believed in. So I had to have a, take a stance. I couldn't be that neutral. And um, that process failed. It was, there was a plebiscite. People went to the ballots. And uh, it failed uh, for a very little margin. And all my newsroom cried like during the whole afternoon. And that day, I understood that Journalists needed to take a stand, not just on that issue, but in you know, a lot of other agendas. And, um, and it was also a moment where we began doing journalism within the social movement and within the civil society movement. And we began understanding that 
in the civil society and in the social movements. There was a lot of energy, a lot of passion, a lot of information and knowledge and underprivileged knowledge because usually it was not the statu quo, what was happening in the streets. So we, were, we, we began asking ourselves, like, what other type of agendas are being cooked in the social movement and in civil society? What type of really important conversations are happening in them? There, and how can we get them out of these type of rooms and the, and the, and the, and the more like underprivileged streets and make and create bottom-up agenda setting processes that seriously change the way the public debate was occurring. So those were the questions we began asking ourselves. And um, after like analyzing a lot of problems that we all know traditional media have, we decided, first of all, to understand that each problem, each issue that we have to deal with has a community of people who are really, really engaged in it, producing knowledge, uh, suffering the problem, um, and they would be like the most invested people interested on that conversation getting expanded and bigger. So the first thing that we, we began doing while we did traditional journalism, because we were reporters and we were doing the reporting, we were also mapping this community conversation. And we began working on this con like concept of what's the community, com the conversation community in each subject that we're researching. And that mapping was very strategic because it wasn't just a, a matter of a list of sources, really knowledgeable and, and, and diverse sources, but it was also a first ring of expan expansion because that network and that community network is very interested on getting that conversation going forward and, and going uh, outward. Um, and the second question that we needed to ask is how do we engage new publics into these civil society conversations? And um, one of the things we had to like critically analyze is that the way media works right now, and it has been working for a long time, is that it's very fragmented. Like you jump from one, one subject to the other one, then there's a lot of things about TikTok and like 46, 45 seconds videos and then like uh, every day you wake up and, and you've, there's a thousand of things and then you go to bed and you don't understand a thing and half of the things you saw is that they're fake, so it's crazy. So, <laughs> so we, our proposal was, hey, let's, let's de de decelerate. Let's, let's go slower, man. Like, let's go a little bit slower. And let's like, do one problem at a time. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to do a two-week uh, subject. And every two weeks, we developed uh, traditional investigations that then we um, delivered to the audiences through our social media channels, but also through this network of community conversation that we had already mapped and engaged and bring into the whole strategy. And we created this three-phase methodology, which we call a social conversation. It has three phases that has become a mantra for us. Speak, understand, and act. So we got our very serious and well-reported investigations, but when we published the investigation, that wasn't the end of the process, as usually was in the traditional media. It was the beginning of the social conversation. So this long investigation had the first phase, which was speak. So we began testing, and we always test and play around with how do I get people relate to the problem I'm delivering it? What's your relationship with it? Do you remember it happened to you? What do you think? Do you know someone who have, has some relation with it? So we begin activating the participation. And once people are related to the problem, we come to the understand where we begin giving them, showing them hypotheses, facts, figures, infographics, etc., so they can actually understand what's happening. And then what all of a sudden we began understanding is that because we were really paying attention to what the audiences began uh, sharing, we learned a lot on what type of needs. And I'll go, I'll go back, we come back to that 
uh, need analysis process later on. Um, so we began looking at, hey, there's this information vacuum. There's this problem here that needs to be solved. So we began developing acting tools, pedagogical, very educative tools based on our reporting, but based also in our social listening that we deliver to the audience. And just to close there and keep the, the conversation um, going, um, this, this system um, really, it, it's funny because this is a young audience uh, panel and I have thought myself, like, I never set up to say, I'm gonna do a young audience medium. You know, like I wanna talk to young audiences. But all of a sudden, because we were talking about causes and we were talking about like social pains in a really like honest and taking a stance, um, young people came, you know? Young people came like in a 70% volume. Um, and I think that tells us a lot of, of what our young audience is standing today because the world is painfully hard, you know? So, and, they, and they aren't just standing there to see. So I think that activating those subjects and activating that need to participate and make a difference that has been part of the like beautiful insights that Mutante has given us. Thank you, this is absolutely fascinating. I think one of the things you're both saying is also like, it's, all, it's about whose voices we're hearing and how you bring voices that maybe weren't being heard to the conversation. So I wanna come back to that in a, in a second. Before we do that, Nanjala, you, you've looked at this kind of across the continent globally. Have you seen kind of other initiatives, other ways of kind of rethinking how news producers, media organizations talk to the audience and engage with, with it? Um, there's two examples. In fact, as you were speaking, I was thinking of these two examples. So a couple of years ago, I did some m and &E research, uh, monitoring and evaluation research for um, UNESCO's community radio programming. And there is a community radio station in the south coast of Kenya that does um, theater based on their news broadcasts. And I thought that was really cool. So they'll do the news broadcast and there's a theater group that kind of takes things from that and will write sort of scripts and will do sort of, it's community theater and I don't know how many people are um, familiar with theater of the oppressed, um, sort of a, 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 a as an approach to people turning issues, problems that are happening in their community into theater that they can then perform and at the same time thinking of, together about solutions to the issues that they're facing. Because as I said, community radio in Kenya is very local. Five kilometer radius is tiny. And so if they're able to really um, think through some of the issues and, and work together to develop the solutions and they feel empowered you know, in the process of both creating and receiving the news. Um, and the other model that is a publication that I've worked with um, several times, uh, been very fortunate to be with them from the very beginning is what The Continent is doing. Um, and The Continent, for those of you who are not familiar, is a publication that comes out of South Africa um, that produces a PDF, a WhatsApp-friendly newspaper. It distributes exclusively on WhatsApp and Signal, um, I think Telegram increasingly. And the idea is to make the news as available as the misinformation. So if someone can just drop, um, I don't know if this happens in some of your cultures, but I know my fellow Africans will relate to this. When you wake up in the morning and your parents send you, good morning, I just got this from so-and-so. <laughs> um, and it's complete, you know, mom, why are you sending me this? <laughs> um, but it's to meet the misinformation where you know, it distributes, and so to distribute the news in the same way. And as a writer for the continent, the ch challenge is always, the articles are 300 words long. And as a, as a journalist, you're kind of like, wait, but then I have to say this, and I have to say that, and I have to say this. It's like, no, I, one thought, think it through carefully, make sure that every single word is doing something because you don't have any spare words. Um, and it's been a fantastic ride. I think the, the, pop, the edition um, that I edited was, the guest edited was, we did a special edition on the US election written exclusively by African journalists in African languages. And we had such amazing feedback from that because it was what you're talking about. How do peop the people talk to each other? We don't, you know, in Kenya, for example, people don't speak to each other in formal English. 
it's patois, it's sheng, it's swahili, it's, you know, when I'm with Kenyans, it just kind of, <laughs> something flips in your head and you just start to speak the language that you're most comfortable in. But, you know, Africa is the most linguistically diverse continent. It's, we're talking about thousands of languages. And so you have to do that in a way that is inviting people on their own terms, but also just recognizing that there has to be a baseline of shared understanding. Um, I think thinking about things like that has really, being part of experiences like that has really driven home that, as what I said before, it's not the news that people aren't engaging with, it's news products. People still want news and people still want information and young people especially still want to know, but um, it's these creative approaches to news products that I think will open up the space a little bit more to people who maybe don't feel represented or included in the more traditional mm -hmm. model. And coming back to that point about kind of distinguishing between news products and established news brands and, and things like this, I think we've seen like a lot of the examples you've given are also like uh, in the previous in the previous point are you know things on TikTok and other social networks are very much driven by individuals, right? Who have their own following, who are maybe more trusted by some of the big brands and, and established institutions. And so you, you you've tried to tap into this, for instance, by trying to bring some of them in in your podcast. How like? Is that doable? Like, can you combine? Can you keep some of that trust, some of that authenticity and sincerity and kind of bring the community yeah, along? And is that part of the solution somehow? Yeah, I mean, it's an, interesting, uh, it's an interesting idea. I think I was just thinking of another example where you had a mainstream news uh, organization like Al Jazeera who took kind of their news and repackaged it for social media, AJ+. Plus. Mm -hmm. Um, that did phenomenally well. They did it in multiple languages. It did really well. I think it's it's stalled a bit now, or it's not doing as well as it used to. But but it was really kind of this moment where it took something that we weren't quite sure how to deal with yet, even as society, not just journalists um, or media folk, and and did that in a way that worked really well for the audience that that they were looking at. What we've tried to do recently is not work with influencers, but work with content creators who have large followings. Um, so they're really dedicated to the art of creating content, which is a bit nicer than kind of the influencer just for the sake of influencing. Um, and so we found that to be really successful. People that are quite aligned with what we're trying to do, quite aligned with the audiences that we're trying to reach, um, and work directly with them to create an audio kind of product, like a podcast, because um, a lot of them don't have it, you know, and one of the reasons for that is it's not as monetizable. Um, they can make a little bit of money on YouTube, they can make a little bit of money on Instagram, but the audio part is more difficult. So this is where, strategically, it makes sense for us to work with them. They have a good audience. We have the tools and the expertise and the, and the, and the, and the uh, professional kind of experience there. Marriaging these two together seems like a good fit, so we've done that. Um, a few times. And I think this really, for me, comes again to the point of data and analytics. Something that I like to point out, and I say this a lot, and my team, you know, probably can, probably repeats it in their sleep, but <laughs> it's the difference between data informed and data driven. I think if you, the, the algorithms are data driven. You click on this, it will give you more of that. You don't click on this, it will give you less of that. Where This is where humans play an important role. The data informed is, okay, I see in the morning and in the evening is when most people listen. During the pandemic, that changed. What can I do to adjust and see what will work and what won't work? And so I think it's really important for us as data is, I mean, we're almost being, you know, we're drowning in data now, um, is to be able to read that and be informed and, and make decisions based mm -hmm. on that, but not blindly follow it. The point about alignment, I think, is, I mean, resonates a lot. And you were refer referencing this earlier uh, on Camille. It's like you are, how, how do you, like, you've chosen to slow things down, go in depth, create engagement. How do you choose on which topics you do that? And how should other, maybe, like, tell us in your case, and do you have views on how others, like, this is part of your DNA, right? There's a lot of media organizations out there that do great work, but don't get it to, to these audiences. So. Should they listen more? Should they find different ways to talk about different topics? And mm. how can they do that? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, actually, I had this insight a couple of days ago that one of the interesting things that Mutante has taught us is that in the middle of a attention economy, uh, in which everybody is like competing for the attention, 
we're paying attention. You know, it's like you gotta you gotta pay more attention <laughs> to what they are saying. And um, but before I I tell you a little bit more on how are we paying attention, I wanted to uh, contribute to to the reflection about how to change the idea of news products and add something else. And is we need to also think of news delivery as news experiences, not just products. There's a lot of experience to be have. Uh, on the news product, uh, production process. Um, we, in the middle of the pandemic, because we were always experimenting and we are always experimenting, experimenting with the idea of, of audience mobilization. How do I empower audiences and how can they help us uh, both create knowledge but also distribute the knowledge that we create together? We uh, partnered with a national newspaper, Science Desk, uh, that they were very worried about um, misinformation about COVID in WhatsApp. And we created this call out for volunteers in the national newspaper that wanted to fight misinformation by joining a WhatsApp group that was gonna receive verified information with very like low density uh, WhatsApp formats that we created and that they were gonna help us distribute that information. And um, we put that, the link uh, to get into the, into the WhatsApp group at 8 a.m. in the morning. Uh, we were hoping that maybe we would have like, I don't know, 250 people uh, help us. And uh, one hour afterwards, the, the link was absolutely full. And we were like, what do we do? Let's put another one. Pfft, it was full. Let's put another one. By the end of the day, we had like 10 uh, WhatsApp groups. We have 3,000 volunteers. Re that began receiving this information and they helped us distribute it along like three months of the pandemic. At some point during that exercise, which was like super moving, uh, we decided to survey these brigadiers, volunteers, and we asked them, okay, um, would you want to do something else besides sharing content? And uh, we put some options and uh, more than 50% of the people say, we want to give you information. We want to help you out with information. So we began experimenting with creating new groups on different subjects that we wanted to investigate on with the uh, idea of creating these conversations inside the WhatsApp groups and begin doing crowdsourcing and crowd like public mobilization around different subjects. We have worked and we have investigated the impact of the pandemic on the mental health of young people um, mental health caregivers and the problems they go through and so forth. We have also done like really big, uh, like 900 uh, people uh, group around social movement, the young social movement that, uh, that uh, exploded in Colombia a couple of, um, of years ago. And uh, we covered the election with these 900 kids and like youngsters. So um, that ju was just to, to make the point of, of the experience in itself. Mm. So basically what we're doing, or do you Can want to... Can I ask you to make the yeah, last sure. point quite quickly? Because in the spirit of what you've just said, it'd be great to hear from the audience as well. Of and course. I think we only have a few minutes left. So, so just, just, just to round up. So we are listening a lot. We are listening a lot. We are building tools to systematize that listening. We're looking for information needs, information vacuums, misinformation, stereotypes and prejudices and uh, also questions and recommendations and we're building a system to systematize all those needs and problems and get our team to solve those needs and problems editorially and try to keep track of it thank you do you have any questions great if I, can, <laughs> if I can ask you to keep them fairly short that'd be amazing and if you could just say your name and Hi, my name is Sabra Almidi. I'm a content creator um, and also a young person. Um, I feel like, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't make that statement. Um, I feel like I really like the point that the gentleman made about marrying two things together, so a content creator and a podcast and bringing the audiences together. I feel like we're missing a trick by having young people on TV. And I think there's, I know TV is saying, oh, we're not, young people aren't watching us, but that's because you're not bringing young, young people on to talk about issues which relates to them. So why do you think TV, like I'm trying to break into TV and it's so hard because no one takes me seriously. Yeah. Why is that? And is there scope for young people on TV? Is my question. Thank you. May I suggest we take another one? Yeah. Just here on the first 
roll, please. Thank you so much. My name is Jayan Aslan. I work at Internews. And uh, I have a question uh, perhaps to, um, well, maybe to all the panel. Uh, in Europe or in the West, I think we sometimes take certain infrastructure into, like, we take it for granted, such as, you know, data being available and cheap, internet being free and uh, not blocked, and also, like, people having the necessary tech skills to uh, work their, their way around it. That's why I really like these examples of PDF um, newsletters and as well as connecting the news into, like, online news into or community radio news into something in uh, in real life uh, with community theater. I was wondering, do you have any other examples uh, where you, because uh, in, in the places that you also work, I'm sure you're also encountering these issues like where people can't even charge their phones sometimes and you need to get them news and how do you then use online tools? So I was wondering if you have any other methods in your toolbox that speaks to that, thank you. Thank you for those questions. So why aren't we seeing young people on TV? <laughs> I mean, maybe because the audience is over 65. <laughs> I guess this means I'm young because I don't watch TV. Yes. Um, I don't. I, 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 I genuinely, I, I haven't had a television for almost 10 years. Um, I think part of the challenge is that television is expensive to make, and it's a gamble for the TV stations to make it, and they have to be very selective about it, and it takes a lot for the, the six lines, I think the people here who work on TV, I think the six lines that someone reads about an issue has 10 people's labor behind it, and I think there, it's just television is a little bit more risk averse than I, please contradict me if you work in television, but I think TV is a little bit more expensive to make and therefore people are less likely to take risks on it. But AJ Plus does have a lot of young people on it. It's still there, I still watch it um, on the phone. Um, I think that would be my, my quick answer. It's really just, I think TV is expensive and, and risky. But I think you're making a broader point actually because that's true of most quote unquote legacy media, right? Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons is also, when you put young people, like when you give them a voice, they do things differently. Yeah. And that scares the hell out of the editors in chief and the people who've been doing the same thing for 20 years. I agree. And I think, I mean, a lot of my younger friends that work in newsroom describe day to day what's basically a gener generational fight. It's like they don't understand each other, the kind of 60 year old editor in chief and the kind of 25 year old reporters, because they have completely different ways of telling the stories because they talk to the, the people they know, the community they know. And I think there's something about how power is distributed within newsrooms and, and organizations that create this. Sorry, I'm, I completely was, forgot was, I'm supposed to moderate. That's totally so what I was saying. Forgot about this. <laughs> One cameo. No, there was this, uh, the, the, yeah. Angela. Oh, um, on the questions of other example. So the data question, it is really important. Um, I think the most expensive internet in the world is still in Africa. Burkina Faso, I think it's like 30 something dollars um, per gigabyte, so it's crazy. Um, there's two pieces of this puzzle. One piece is that what, we've, what I found in the research that I did on how information jumps from social media to traditional media, the zeitgeist in Kenya, is that the lack, because the newsrooms are struggling financially, because the newsrooms also just don't have the capacity to have someone in every county who is covering all of these things, they depend on what trends, this happens all over the world, whatever is trending is very likely to end up on TV, on the radio, and this make, makes social media matter in a way that is not linear. It's not that there has to be 40 million Kenyans on Twitter for what is happening on Twitter to matter, it's that the nation, the standard, all of these media houses have someone whose job it is to make sure that what is on social media is on the news at seven o'clock. And that is what, that's a, a line of connection that I think kind of diffuses this idea that just because there aren't X number of people online doesn't mean that what happens online isn't important. However, tied to that is the, the flip side of the coin is this fetishization of digital. And I think we kind of have to walk that line very carefully. 
many years ago now, I think six or seven years ago, we also happened, we all saw what happened when Facebook changed the algorithms on all the newsrooms that were dependent on those algorithms to get their content. I think it was the Hungary and the Czech Republic where one or two independent outlets had to shut down because it just completely disrupted their income streams. They were so dependent on clicking and, and, and metrics and all of that stuff. And when the company changes the data on you, what do you do about that? Influencers are going to find themselves in the same, are, are finding themselves in the same bucket. The moment Instagram changes its homepage and your stuff doesn't get online, then you can't make the rent um, that month. So I recognize why people are converging around the opportunities that digital and data presents. But ultimately, news still has to go to people. And the best models that I've seen are the ones that understand that, um, that human side of it. You talk about using the news as a pedagogical tool. That's one of the things that got me into reading newspapers was that I used to read the newspaper to learn English. I used to read the newspaper to learn Swahili. That doesn't happen anymore because the newspapers are not really thinking of in, in, in a country in a country where the average age is 19.2, most people are going to be in school. Most people are going to be in university. So instead of pitching the newspaper as you know this highfalutin sort of thing, it makes sense to embed a pedagogical element to it. Organize yourself into reading groups, that kind of thing. So I think that piece of the puzzle in countries with populations that skew young could also uh, really help with that, and we're just not seeing enough of that. Thank Sorry. you. I'm afraid we're going to have to end on this. There's another panel after this. Just want to thank you all for being here. Thank you see all you, three for see this. You and we'll have beer. Thank you. Amazing. It, it, it goes so quickly. It's so